So if you had to describe a game that most people would assume that Rim and Scott would have no interest in, 1846 should be near the top of that list. No, I mean, it's not a game we have no interest in. It's well, just, it's just one of those like stereotypical games we sort of always jokingly refer to, right? It's like we laugh about like, uh -huh, a train game that uses crayons or Grognard war game. This or is, train game where you only take four turns. Yeah, this is this is a, you know, a stereotypical Grognard train game that we sort of, you know, the kind that you see in the game store and you look at and you go, uh, uh, I know that kind of game and then you don't ever play it. You very rarely see people playing these kinds of games and when you do, they tend to fit certain stereotypes. Yes, the yes. The games tend to take a very long time. The games tend to be more simulatory than the sort of elegant machine building type games we tend to prefer. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to be more ex experiences where you explore a set of complex mechanics rather than a game where you read the rules and already have a pretty good heuristic about what to do. Yep. They also uh, accurately represent true historical events, at least related to trains in this case, so that you can you know, learn. Like, so someone who's a nerd about old trains would like get jollies playing this game, right? Regardless of the winning and losing factor. Now, what's funny is that even games like, uh, not Age of Steam, but uh, Railroad Tycoon, like the baby version, that game, all the cars when you buy trains, they have that numerical like 422, like this is a 422 train. And because of that, I actually know what that means. I don't know what that means. It's those guide wheels versus drive wheels versus those trailing wheels. How many of each there are. Oh, okay. And you mean only on the locomotive, the, all the, the cars behind Yeah, the it. locomotive itself. Yeah. But uh, 1846 has that amped up to 11. Mm -hmm. So this game was presented. Basically, our friends Chris and Anthony liked this game, and they played it. And Well, there's a whole series of 18xx games that are all train games from different geographies and areas, I guess mostly in the U.S., but I assume they've also got Euro rails and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that are, you know, so this one is about the Midwest and, of course, the year 1846, like what was happening with train companies there and then. Yep, and apparently, the I have not looked at these other games, but I've learned a little bit about them. All the other 18 dot dot games are very similar, but have like soul crushingly esoteric differences or like very specific nuances that make them completely different games. Right. So it's like you could learn one and then easily learn to play another one in a short amount of time once you've learned one, but there will be significant differences. You'll probably not win because you'll like, you'll mess those up. Right. Because, but I guess if you're super studied on train history, maybe you'll just anticipate those differences because they match well, real world events. Yeah, so like well. you might know about one of the like small railroads, like like the Erie Line or something, and what happened to it. And then you, when you see what happens to it in the game, like oh, it makes perfect sense. Because actually, there is this this line that used to go around Lake Erie. It's not in this game. But it is a train line I know a lot about. Well, was it there in 1846 or before then or after then? Uh, I think it was around. It was around before then, definitely. It just does not play in the 1846 game. I think its heyday was earlier. Mm -hmm. But I know stuff about it because it's intrinsically tied to the history of Cedar Point. Anyway. So yeah, but the other interesting thing about this game, like the 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 core point I want to get out in the review before we get into the details, is that we both enjoy it, mm -hmm. and it's not I. Bad. Did not expect to feel the desire to not only play it, but to play it again and having played it twice to actually really want to play it a third time. Well, here's the thing is like, I don't super want to play it. Right. But it's like, I totally will play it. And it's sort of on this borderline where it's like, it's got a lot of action. Right. One thing I really like about it is that even if you're losing and getting your ass kicked, like you still do stuff. There is right? an exception to that. Amanda got into a specific situation where she was pushed to bankruptcy by nonsense and literally could not do anything meaningful for many turns in a row. I guess so, but it's really hard to not do. It was it was such a like crazy situation, a turn of events <laughs> that happened that she had no control over. There's also like a lot is a lot of even though the rules are sort of esoteric, there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do in like, yeah. terms of like stock trading and train building and train buying. Well, it's like, like so there's a bunch of very fiddly, specific, arbitrary seeming exceptions to general rules, but they are further from the core of the things I asked to be able to do than the games where I would complain about that. Like, right. there's limits on how many stock certificates you can own, but that doesn't really come into play until the very end of the game. So even though that is an arbitrary distinction, it is not something that I bumped into in the course of natural play. Right. 
But anyway, so the the main thing is like the game takes a little while to play. It takes a few hours. Yeah. You can play fast if you've got skills and help and experience, but it still takes a while no matter what. The game and has it's sort a- of on this border between where it takes too long, it's not worth it. If it was shorter, it would be like the best game ever. But it's not so long, like Monopoly long, you want to kill yourself. It's like, okay, I put the time aside. It's still, and and unlike, say, Eclipse, where there's a lot of time sitting doing nothing, you're doing stuff the whole time. You don't yep. get, you know, I haven't gotten bored and distracted. Usually when there's an Eclipse playing, Eclipse takes as long or longer, but I'll spend a lot of time during an Eclipse game sitting around being bored, waiting for my turn. In this, that's almost never happens, right? Because either, either while I'm waiting for my turn, I'm thinking about, like, stock value and like could i pull this off over the next few turns and wonder what scott's gonna do or i'm watching some drama unfold in the stock market yeah and you can only do a very small number of things on your turn so the 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 rounds go around very quickly and then everyone sort of calculates simultaneously yep so without that downtime like you're into it for those hours you're actually probably in sort of play per time, it's very efficient, right? Whereas Eclipse, if you actually, you know how like they talk about if you took an NFL game and cut out all the commercials, the game is only like 20 minutes of real time or yep. something like that, of actual playing from like start of plays to end of plays. This game is like, no, it's actually four hours long and use the whole four hours. Eclipse is like five hours long, but actually you're only using like one hour of your own time and four hours of waiting. But it is also interesting how such a... Uh, sort of divergent and simulatory experience is crafted from a relatively small set of relatively elegant mechanics. Yeah, no, there's not actually... It's like, it looks complicated, it feels complicated, but if you were to, say, redraw this game or graphically design it to remove all the history stuff and the reality stuff and... I would not be interested. Well, yeah, but make the symbology, you know, more uh, Oh, I see where you're going with this. Right? You would see the game actually isn't really as complicated as it appears. Yep. Right? It is it is actually not it's like, oh, you have a round where you do stock stuff, and then you do have two rounds of not of playing the game, and then you do stock stuff again. But what's That's also it. interesting is stock market, play, play, stock market. Games you like, go around and around games and around. Games like this that are reasonably simulatory, like that kind of game style, the fact that it has so much history steeped into it, like the proper nouns and all those like other train companies, it actually helps you build pretty reasonably good directional heuristics yeah yeah based on just associating the fiction of the game with the mechanics Mm -hmm. like the combinations of some of those like independent railroads and certain things you might want to do in a region is very intuitive like it would be in the real world Mm -hmm. so the only real problem i have with this game before we get into like explaining how it actually works is that so there's a concept in that book, Characteristics of Games, on uh, called uh, busy work, like games that have busy work. Like this stuff. does have one busy work in it. But I'm gonna go one step further, and there's I think I want to make a distinction. I've been using this word a lot lately in game reviews between pure busy work and what I like to call rituals. This game has a lot of rituals. Rituals are fine. Meaning, but meaning that they are things that are moderately complex to do, need to be done for the game to continue, but they can be basically entirely removed from your... Like, you don't need to know them to play as long as at least one person playing knows them. I think it was. I think it's basically... There's a bunch of stuff that a computer could do and then the game would take a lot well, of hence, time. Well, hence, Chris had that spreadsheet that we <laughs> use for the dividends and all that crap. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have that spreadsheet, it takes longer to figure that out. So there, And there is a ritual of moving the stock stuff up and down and figuring out the numbers on the dividends yeah, and all that stuff. Yeah, this one makes a triple jump. That one makes a double jump. It's yep. like, I didn't need to know. I mean, I guess it would have helped me have better directional heuristics if I did fully understand that. But, but I, I found I you don't need to fully understand yeah, it I didn't, to play I, well. I didn't need to. I was, I was able to play well enough without knowing the exact excruciating details, but because the board game, someone has to know them, but only one person needs to know them and sort of be the computer. So that's my difference. Busy work is things that are generally equally spread among the players. Like, imagine if you were playing Civilization, the video game, on on tabletop, but the rules were not changed at all. You have to be like, okay, this city produces this much food this turn. Okay, it has enough food for population to increase, yep. which means this much food gets eaten and this much surplus food is left over. And it's like a thing that when you play the video game, the computer just does for you, but because you're playing a board game here, you have to do that yourself. Yeah, but you part, can it you sucks. can choose to zoom in and pay attention to the specific math if you want to, but you don't need to for most. You just need to know generally. I want my population to go up. I need more food. So in this game, the ritual is that 
as lo- as only as long as one person can facilitate all the details, which Chris did for us, mm-hmm. then I probably couldn't play if it wasn't with. Yeah, the game is that. way more fun, and that's why I'd be very interested in a well-made computer version of this game because the only I, other thing that has significant ritualistic. Well, this one actually is busy work because yes. players have to do it on their own. This is the busy is work. Guys are calculate to. the optimal set of routes to run your trains on. Right. So here's how this works: is your each train company. Yeah, let's talk about how the game actually plays. Right, so you you have a train company. And well, tra- no, you don't. You found a train company. Yes, sure, whatever. And you might have the more train than one. Com- the, there is the train- and someone might steal it from you. Whatever. The train companies have money and trains and stocks. You, as an individual person, also have monies and trains and stocks, right? And whoever has enough stock in a company controls that company. But obviously, someone could buy all the stock and take the company. Yep. There's companies that don't exist yet in the game. Ever at the beginning of the game, everyone buys one company or founds one. But there's some unfounded ones. You can always pick those up mid-game. You might found a second one. You could have two different train companies. Yeah, it's like, you know, uh, but anyway. There's independent train companies. You can technically have a third one. When it's your turn, when you operate, you operate the companies that you control because you have enough stock in them that you're the president and you you are the boss of that company. Now, this is where it gets fascinating. The goal of the game is for you, the player, to have the most money at the end. Yep. But... Your money is entirely distinct from the company's money. Mm -hmm. That is the interesting thing. So when you operate a train company, you spend the train company's money. Yeah, like you can't use your personal money to buy a train for the train company. But you can in buy to, stock in a train company, which, and that you, money goes right. to the train so company. If, if the company still owns some of its own stock, you could buy stock from the company thus to move your money in and the stock out. And then when the train company gets revenues, those monies go to the shareholders. So if you own shares in a company or your opponent's companies, when that train company operates and brings in revenue, you would get some of that money. But... The train company still owns some of its own shares. That's how it gets more money. If a train company loses all of its shares, it can't really make any more money and it has to continue to operate without any revenues because shareholders are taking all the revenues. Yep. Now, the other interesting thing is that the train companies, they can invest in their own infrastructure, which basically just means buying trains. Yep. And they can invest in shared track infrastructure yeah, that literally the, anyone can use. This is the most interesting part of the game, right? Is that in most train games, like in Railroad Tycoon, you're moving cubes around and stuff like that, right? That's not what's going on here, right? What happens here is on a train company's turn when it operates, it can basically like do only a little bit, very limited how much track they can lay out. They can like what do one upgrade and one piece of track. Yep. Pretty much, or two pieces of track, I think. Is but also... not two upgrades. No. I messed that up like twice. Yeah. So you can only lay out a little bit of track. And what you want, and the thing is the tracks belong to everybody. There's no owner of track. It's just you're upgrading the tracks yep. around the country. Or the city where the train station is. So if you upgrade mm-hmm. Centralia to have a better train station, that's great for everybody. Right. And now the train company has stations. And if all the stations in a city are blocked up, well, then someone else can't run their trains past it. But as long as they basically, your, your trains start from one of your stations and then they run where as long as they're not blocked pretty much to wherever they're going to make the most money. And so this is the busy work part is basically you say, well, this train company has these two trains. These two trains can drive this far. Here's where my stations are. What are the routes that will make the most money for these two trains. And this is where a video game, you could literally hit it's, a button and it would tell you the maximum run. Yeah, it's not like a decision. It's just like, what's the answer? You're trying to look at the board and figure out like how much money. It's like, you ought, you, the rule is you make the maximum, but it's like, what is the maximum? You had to, some, it's like a little... And you might choose to make less, but, and there oh. are situations where that might make sense. Yeah, sure, but yeah. it's, you make the maximum. It's yeah, just, pretty much. You might fail to figure out the maximum, because it's trying to hard to figure out. It's like, well, I can use all the tracks on the board. What is the best route? Well, I guess it's these four stations. And you, most of the time you get it right, but it's like annoying. I, if you played in a computer, the computer could just be like, your revenue is X. Done. It would the thing take is, a at fraction the same time, of a second. Part of my brain, it's kind of fun until the map gets really <laughs> complex toward the end. Yeah, in the early game, it's very obvious because you've only got like two stations. Like, well, yep. it's, it's these two stations, I get 80 bucks. But later in the game, it's like, oh, no, I can get $10 more if I go this way. All right. And 
the other thing is that your your trains cannot share a uh, track. They can't like bump into each other. They like be- each track route or each hex edge can only be used once for you. For you, but uh, someone else can use those hex edges. Just yep. not you can't use your own hex edge twice if you have more than one train. So yeah. And there's all these other mechanics, like so you can buy at the beginning of the game. There's this whole draft where you can buy independent companies that do different things Mm -hmm. up to and including entire small independent railroads that run like a real company and eventually get brought into the big railroad but you the player buy them with your own money but then maybe you sell them to one of your train companies Mm -hmm. but the game ends there's a there's an amount of money when that amount of money is taken from the bank then you, the game ends. Yeah, imagine some... imagine playing Monopoly and the bank has ten thousand dollars in. I'm just making up a number. Yeah, once that and, number, once that once, bank hits zero, right? And once the ten thousand dollars in the bank is completely gone, the bank has zero left. You keep giving people money for that round until everyone has the amount of money they're supposed to have. Yep. And then whoever has the most wins. So when that happens, then the the winner is whoever themselves, not their companies, just themselves has the most money between their money and the actual value of the stock they own. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah, so this game has, like, the, the, the interesting parts of the game, right? You know, the, the large macro strategy parts is the big one is the buying of trains because the trains go out of style and they become obsolete. And if the train company can't afford to buy new or better trains, they're just done. They're screwed, right? So you have to basically acquire, get a big pile of money in the train company so that the train company can buy a larger, better, superior train like two or three times during the game. One happens almost immediately. Then there's the next one is a little hard, and then the final one which is super hard. And you can get into situations where older trains become like obsolete and run a little bit and then they're just like literally worth yeah the last the, those trains get like one last run and then they're they're out you better have the new train lined up and it's like you have to make your trains companies profitable enough that they can keep upgrading the trains and get that final upgrade and you have to manage how much of the stock you you like you buy versus how much you leave in the company yeah if um, you leave too many shares in the company then you're sort of losing out on money and also leaving those stocks available to like be bought up by other people. But you're letting the company profit from its own work instead of extracting that wealth early. Yeah, but if you buy the shares to, you know, you got to buy, it's like you got to buy them, but you don't want to buy them too early, you want to buy them too late. But you can also buy ma- shares in other people's companies. Yep, which is crucial. To like, uh, yeah, it's like, well, Rim's train company is better than mine. Doesn't mean I'm going to lose. It, you know, I could maybe yeah. buy all his shares out, right? Now his train company doesn't bring It's interesting any- how accurate to the time the corporate stuff is. Yep. Because you literally, you're trying to extract as much wealth from the system <laughs> as possible. Mm-hmm. You don't give a fuck about the train company. Yeah, it doesn't, it, your train company doesn't have to be the best one. You know, the strategy I saw Chris use a lot was have one train company, run it into the ground, then have a second one that comes in later, and that one runs to the end game. Because when you found a train company, you do an IPO and you can pick the value of your stock. Right, so it's like he makes a bunch of early game money by running one train company in the ground, uses that on a second train company that now has a bunch of money in its coffers so it can buy the better train. Anyway. So the in terms of play and the way it feels, you're... Using more real world fuzzy heuristics. Also, when that second train company comes in, it doesn't really need to buy tracks because there's already tracks everywhere. Exactly. But you sort of have to just play it and explore these mechanics and kind of bounce off of them. Like if you mm-hmm. play this game with anyone who's played it before, you'll have fun, you will lose. Yeah, that's I think that's the one best thing I can say about this game. Even though it is a competitive skill game and also has a historical element and a thematic element, right? Uh and it takes a while. I've never been upset by losing or winning at this game. Yeah, it's an experience. It's just like it's just like oh, you get to have a bunch of fun times playing trains, running trains, buying and selling stocks, and it, like it feels good. It doesn't feel like some roll and move garbage like Monopoly. It's all decisions. There's not like what luck is there in this game? Nothing. Is there any luck at all in this goddamn? Just thing? the initial drafting. Yeah, I don't think there's, there's not a there's not a deck. There's not a dice roll. There's not a nothing. Yep. Right? And it just feels way good the whole time, so you don't really, you know, you don't get too upset. And even though I don't think think I've ever won, I've always had done well enough, had like a bunch of monies. It's not like I got blown up and sat there getting, you know, the shit kicked out of me. But I could play this a few more times, and I'm curious about trying the... Because apparently, 
uh, as from what I gather, this one is probably the most accessible. Yeah, I don't see a reason to play the other ones unless you're a super trained nerd. Or unless you've played this one a bunch of times and you're kind of sick of it. Yeah. The one thing is that every time I play this, I've played it three times now. Also, I actually think. playing one of the other ones might give insight, like if the rules are a little different about Maybe. a corporate thing. Yeah. Like strategies back I think you'd only do game. that if you're way into it. True. Right? If you're just a board gamer in general, it's like you're going to try one of them, try this one. If you want to try a game that's more like these simulatory, war gamey, like weird stuff, this is a pretty good one for a Euro gamer to try as long as you have someone who is going to teach you and do the rituals. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, the one thing about this game, I've played it three times, and even though it, I've played it three times, there's plenty of times to learn the rules of a game, is that it's there's much time between plays that I sort of forget the, the not the made not the general rules but these small details right when exactly do these trains expire when exactly can you start doing this versus doing that and whatnot and those details matter a lot so what happens is I forget those details the next time I play and I make a mistake for example the most recent time we played at Pax Unplugged I definitely made a huge mistake I did something on a turn, and there was no reason I couldn't have done that thing a turn earlier, which yep. would have been just better. I just did it a turn later than I could have for no reason, just because I didn't realize I could at that time, and that cost me some money, whatever, right? But it's like, if I could play the game twice in a row or twice very close to each other, I would basically remember all those tiny details that I have probably have already forgotten since PAX Unplugged, in the first game, like the warm-up, remember how to play, remember all the details game, yep. and then play a second game with no excuses and no forgetting of those details, and probably perform really well. Like, I give myself an actual above 0% chance of winning if I could play twice in a row in game two. In game one, no, 0% chance, but in game two, I think if I played twice in a row, I would have a greater than 0% chance of winning. So you want to know the kind of person who plays this game? I'm looking at Board Game Geek. I just had, like, the screenshot up. Yep. The first comment, uh, someone commented on this individual picture, mm -hmm. and the comment is, why is there a city tile on the hex immediately to the west of Detroit? And sure enough, there's one there. Because there's no city there in the game. Mm -hmm. And the next response is, did they house rule Ann Arbor in? And yet a third person, uh, basically, there's a lot of people chatting about this error in this one random screenshot on Board Game Geek. You mean photograph? Yeah. It's not a screenshot. It's a screenshot. It's not a screenshot. Screenshot no. of a board game. It's not. I'm I'm going with that. <laughs> okay. It's a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> but someone noticed that and there is a robust discussion in this one thread about <laughs> literally this one picture among dozens. Yeah. Uh so yeah, if you are at all, you know, it's like you know, if you hear people talk about like these, you know, things that, you know, it's sort of like I talked about back in the day, Fist of the North Star. Like, you keep hearing about Fist of the North Star, but you never yep. actually go to watch it, right? It's just like a thing you know that's in your hobby, a thing you keep hearing about, but you never experience it yourself. You keep hearing about like super nerdy train games, super nerdy war games or things like that, but you never actually go and play them ever. You just know that that's sort of out there. It's like... It is. It's out there. You heard of it. It's a thing. Go check it out at least once. Yep. It might be worth it. You might like it. You might discover something new. And even if not, you'll learn something, and then you'll learn. You just don't have to do it again. Yeah, and actually, to be honest, this game is literally the in the reason why I was inspired to make that new panel on the top 40, bo or the 40 board games you should play. Mm -hmm. Well, tabletop games, because I'm going to sneak some RPGs and card games in there. Yeah. Because, yeah. <coughs> so, yeah, uh, we enjoyed this game. And it's the kind of game that a lot of people who know us would assume we would not enjoy and shows what you know. Well, I mean, I wouldn't buy it. I wouldn't play it. Oh, no. It. I would not play it without someone who was able yeah. to do the rituals I wouldn't, for me. I wouldn't play it super frequently, but it's the kind of thing I could play, you know, maybe a few more times before, you know, I've had enough of it. And, you know, I don't think I could keep enjoying it forever, though. Yeah. But it's like, it's well, still... Well, because eventually you'll have explored all the sort of mechanics. And once you've explored them, if you actually try to hyper-optimize the game, yeah, I, I don't no, know I if no it would still be fun. I have no interest in that. But it is, it's just like, it's a really, in terms of, even though it's cost a lot of time to play, I can't get over the fact you get so much value. Like, you're constantly doing stuff that whole time. And it's like, every time I've played it, like, time has flown by. And it's like, whoa, it's already that time? And it's like, because you're just playing the whole time. There's no... There's no downtime where you're getting bored or feeling like it's long. Yeah. I also do like the simple thing that I wish more games did of 
if you have a thing a machine you can crank or a thing you can operate the turns are do the stock thing and then you crank that machine twice. Yeah, and you're too always, many machine games don't let you crank it enough times. And you're the making other game that does this is oh my good. The decisions you're making are engaging and interesting, and you have a lot of flexibility to be creative. It's like you can you have money. What are you gonna do with it, businessman? But just a lot of games. If you have a machine that players can crank, let them crank it more. The game's gonna feel better. Yep. Go oh my goods at the end of the game. Crank it twice. Yep. That I like that. I haven't seen that enough. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm I'm so hungry. Uh, I I can smell what Emily's cooking in there. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.